Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we'll be discussing Book 1 and Chapter 5 of Memories of Ice, a novel set in the Malazan Books of the Fall. This is Part 1 of 12 of our... I'm <laughs> just kidding. Prom. <laughs> this is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. <laughs> this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the book in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. And since we're just beginning, I'm going to work really hard at keeping it spoiler free as possible. This chapter here, again, I'm going to have some challenging stuff that I'm going to have to try and dodge because it's opening so many different possibilities. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A quick warning. Today's episode contains topics not suitable for young listeners, up to and including extreme violence. There we go, possibly. <laughs> our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, chapter five. Two days and seven leagues of black clinging clouds of ash and Lady Envy's Talaba showed not a single stain. <laughs> Grumbling, Talk the Younger pulled the caked cloth from his face and slowly lowered his pack to the ground. He never thought he'd bless the sight of a sweeping, featureless, grassy plain, but after the volcanic ash, the undulating vista stretching northward beckoned like paradise. Lady Envy asked, Will this hill suffice for a camp? It seems frightfully exposed. What if there are marauders on this plain? Talk said, granted, marauders aren't usually clever, but even the stupidest bandit would hesitate before trying three segula. The wind you're feeling up here will keep the biting insects away come night, lady. I wouldn't recommend low ground on any prairie. She said, I bow to your wisdom, scout. He coughed, straightening to scan the area, then said, can't see your four-legged friends anywhere. She said, nor your bony companion. Do you believe they have stumbled into mischief? He studied her, bemused, and said nothing. She raised an eyebrow, then smiled. Talk swiftly turned his attention back to his pack. He muttered, I'd best pitch the tents. Lady Envy said, As I assured you last night, Talk, my servants are quite capable of managing such mundane activities. I'd much rather you assumed for yourself a higher rank than mere menial laborer for the duration of this great adventure. He paused and asked, You wish me to strike heroic poses against the sunset, Lady Envy? She exclaimed, Indeed! <laughs> Talk said, I wasn't aware I existed for your entertainment. Lady Envy said, oh, now you're cross again. She stepped closer, rested a sparrow light hand on his shoulder. She went on, please don't be angry with me. I can hardly hold interesting conversations with my servants, can I? Nor is your friend Tool a social blossom flushed with enlivening vigor. And while my two pups are near perfect companion in always listening and never interrupting, one yearns for the spice of witty exchanges. You and I talk. We have only each other for this journey. So let us fashion the bonds of friendship. Staring down at the bundled tents, Talk the Younger was silent for a long moment. Then he sighed. I'm a poor excuse for witty exchanges, lady. Alas, I am a soldier and scant else. He thought, more, I have a soldier's scars, who can not but flinch upon seeing me. She said, not modesty, but deception, Talk. He winced at the edge to her tone. She continued, you have been educated, far beyond what is common for a professional soldier, and I've heard enough of your sharp exchanges with the Talan I masked to value your wit. What is this sudden shyness? Why the growing discomfort? Her hand had not moved from his shoulder. He said, you're a sorceress, Lady Envy, and sorcery makes me nervous. I imagine he's also wary of being manipulated. She's got that skill maxed out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the only way she fails a luck roll is if she throws a one. Dude, she's, there's no way. <laughs> she's got intimidation on lockdown. She's got charisma on lockdown. It's a terrifying combination because yes. depending on the flip of a coin, one second you're terrified of her, the next you're looking at her and you, you can't <laughs> look away. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, yeah. Oh, it'd be so nerve wracking. It's dangerous. Yeah, she's very dangerous. <laughs> Lady Envy withdrew her hand. She said, I see, or rather, I do not. Your Talani mass was forged by a ritual of such power as this world has not seen in a long time, Talk the Younger. His stone sword alone is invested to an appalling degree. It cannot be broken, not even chipped, and it will cut through wards effortlessly. No warren can defend against it. I would not wager on any blade against it when in Tool's hands. And the creature himself, he is a champion of sorts, isn't he? 
Among the Talani Mass, Tool is something unique. You have no idea the power, the strength he possesses. Does Tool make you nervous, soldier? I've seen no sign of that. And there was a valuable piece of information in there about Tool's sword. We had no idea that the weapon had been so invested. Was it hinted at in Dead House about their weapons being invested in the um, nascent on that ship when he gave that sword up to him was it who did he give it to truth he gave it to stormy okay and he gave him that one sword but isn't there some hint that that is invested yes but i didn't think of it to this degree she's saying right. that it is maximally invested yes it can cut through anything basically it can cut through everything yes there's nothing that <laughs> i don't see it's like i feel like i want to see this against dragapur i'm sorry that's the only thing i have to gauge this against it's like hmm, that's not a good thought mm. i guess we don't want to see that probably not because if there's a chance that dragapur fails you don't know what's going to happen. Right. It's almost like we talked about last week where you open the box and unleash all the bad guys. Yeah. Okay. Talk snapped. Well, he's shrunk in hide and bones, isn't he? Tool doesn't brush against me at every chance. He doesn't throw smiles at me like lances into my heart, does he? He doesn't mock that I once had a face that didn't make people turn away, does he? Her eyes were wide. She quietly said, I do not mock your scars. He glared over at the three motionless masked segula. He thought, oh, Hood, I've made a mess of things here, haven't I? Are you laughing behind those face shields, warriors? Sometimes I wonder if the Segula have a form of sign language like the Bene Gesserit from Dune in order to communicate with each other non-verbally. I'm kind of intimating that myself from here, from these three. I know something is being done to them to force them under bond ship to this woman to envy but it's like it's very unwilling even though she's got them on lockdown she doesn't have them on lockdown so i'm assuming there's a lot of hand i'm you know real minute i'm assuming there's a lot of that going on between these fellows okay interesting so it's almost like later on in this section here the highest rank of them he speaks to lady envy which showed to me oh that he views her as a superior in some way. So it's almost like she's not fully mind controlling them at all times, but she does exude some level of control over them. She's broken them some way to earn respect. Yeah, it's almost like that. Very cool. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. Talk said, my apologies, lady. I regret my words. She said, yet hold to them nonetheless. Very well. It seems I must accept the challenge then. He looked up at her and asked, challenge? She smiled and said, indeed. Clearly you think my affection for you is not genuine. I must endeavor to prove otherwise. Talk said, lady. She interrupted. And in your efforts to push me away, you'll soon discover that I am not easily pushed. He asked, to what end, Lady Envy? He thought, all my defenses broken down. For your amusement? Her eyes flashed and Talk knew with certainty the truth of his thoughts. Pain stole through him like cold iron. He began unfolding the first tent. Gareth and Balejag arrived, bounding up to circle around Lady Envy. A moment later, a swirl of dust rose from the ochre <laughs> grasses a few paces from where Tot crouched. Tool appeared, carrying across his shoulders the carcass of a pronghorn antelope, which he shrugged off to thump on the ground. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Y'all have to understand that Carmine and I do share something together to do this show. And I scroll down to the page, and they're highlighted in what I presume is ochre. <laughs> <laughs> is the word ochre highlighted in ochre and i'm like oh my gosh i just can't stop oh my gosh that's great <laughs> wow okay <laughs> ochre now that's one of my favorite words because it's just a, it's such an awful word to me that's ochre edgar rice burrow used ochre a lot mars is very ochre colored oh yeah <laughs> It's a lot of ochre in, in John Carter Mars series, my word. <laughs> it's like the book could be subtitled The Ochre Trilogy or The Ochre tw well, no, the, it's a It's a 12 thing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, move along, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Talk saw no wounds on the animal and thought, probably scared it to death. Lady Envy cried, oh, wonderful. We shall dine like nobles tonight. She swung to her servants and said, come, Senu. You have some butchering to do. Talk thought, won't be the first time either. Lady Envy went on, and you other two, um, what shall we devise for you? Idle hands just won't do. Mock, you shall assemble the hide bathtub. Set it on that hill over there. You needn't worry about water or perfumed oils. I shall take care of all that. Thurul, unpack my combs and robe. That's a good lad. Talk glanced over to see Tool facing him. The scout grimaced wryly. Tool strode over and said, we can begin our arrow-making efforts, soldier. Talk said, aye, once I'm done with the tents. 
Tool said very well. I shall assemble the raw material we have collected. We must fashion a tool kit. Tok had put up enough tents in his soldiering days to allow him to maintain fair attention to Tool's preparations while he worked. He thought it was always a wonder, and something of a shock, to watch the deftness of Tool's withered, almost fleshless hands as he worked. An artist's hands. After watching Tool work for a time, Lady Envy sighed. Such extraordinary skill. Do you think in the time before we began to work metal, we all possessed such abilities? Tok shrugged and said, seems likely. According to some Malazan scholars, the discovery of iron occurred only half a thousand years ago, for the peoples of the Quan Tali continent in any case. Before that, everyone used bronze. And before bronze, we used unalloyed copper and tin. Before those, why not stone? Lady Envy said, ah, I knew you had been educated, Tok the Younger. Human scholars, alas, tend to think solely in terms of human accomplishments. Among the elder races, the forging of metals was quite sophisticated. Improvements on iron itself were known. My father's sword, for example. Tok grunted, sorcery, investment. It replaces technological advancement. It's often a means of supplanting the progress of mundane knowledge. Lady Envy said, why soldier? You certainly do have particular views when it comes to sorcery. However, did I detect something of rote in your words? Which bitter scholar, some failed sorcerer, no doubt, has espoused such views? Despite himself, Tok grinned. He said, aye, fair enough. Not a scholar, in fact, but a high priest. She said, ah, well, cults see any advancement sorceress or, indeed, mundane as potential threats. You must dismantle your sources, Tok the Younger, lest you do nothing but ape the prejudices of others. And I found that to be sound advice there. Mm -hmm. It does help to understand what lens the author of a work views the world with in order to sense any potential bias built into their writings. I agree. Very wholeheartedly. Talk said, you sound just like my father. Lady Envy said, you should have heeded his wisdom. Talk thought, I should have, but I never did. Leave the empire, he said. Find someplace beyond the reach of the court, beyond the commanders and the claw. Keep your head low, son. This brings to mind the Mark Twain quote, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. End yeah. quote. I loved, I, had, I didn't realize that was a Mark Twain. I've heard a variation on that theme kind of countrified by a, a comedian and I, I i can't really spell it out right I mean, it's not dirty or anything like that. i just can't I, i'm not very eloquent when it comes to trying to tell comedic things so but i've heard it told in another way but the same same thing but it's, it's, it's a very funny quote i like that finished with the last of the three tents talk made his way to tool's side 70 paces away on the summit of a nearby hill mock had assembled the wood framed hide lined bathtub Lady Envy, Thirul marching at her side with folded robe and bath kit in his arms, made her way towards it. The wolf and dog sat close to Senu where he worked on the antelope. The Segala flung spare bits of meat to the animals every now and then. This exact scene happens in my house when I'm doing anything in the kitchen. I have two dogs begging on either side of me. <laughs> I just came from a lunch with my folks today, and my dad's got these oriental short hairs and the shoes over. The one in particular sitting there watching, waiting on the side, licking them lips. You know, you're like, oh, I love that. But it's, it's funnier with the dogs because they're big. You got big dogs, right? They're huskies. I mean, to some people, they're big. If right. you have some Lhasa Opsa or some toy yeah, dog, right. yeah, they're going to be big compared to them. But That toy dog could run that clan. We've seen it. That's what dead house, <laughs> <laughs> dead house skates. Roach. I'm surprised you haven't got a dog just to see if it would do that and run them. It's like, <laughs> the last thing I need is some little yippy small dog that's just, and you know, going around and inciting violence. That's all I need. <laughs> Tool had completed four small stone tools. Crouching down beside him, Talk examined the finished items and said, all right, I'm starting to understand this. These ones are for working the shaft and the fletching, yes? Tool nodded and said, the antelope will provide us with the raw material. We need gut string for binding, hide for the quiver and its straps. Talk asked, what about this crescent-shaped one? Tool said, the bone reed shafts must be trued. Talk said, ah, yes, I see. Won't we need some kind of glue or pitch? Tool said, ideally, yes. Since this is a treeless plane, however, we shall make do with what we possess. The fletching will be tied on with gut. Talk said, you make the fashioning of arrowheads look easy, Tool, but something tells me it isn't. Tool said, some stone is sand, some is water. Edged tools can be made of the stone that is water. Crushing tools are made of the stone that is sand, but only the hardest of those. Tok said, and here I've gone through life thinking stone is stone. Tool said, in our language, we possess many names for stone. 
names that tell of its nature, names that describe its function, names for what has happened to it and what will happen to it, names for the spirit residing within it, names talk interrupted. <laughs> all right, all right, I see your point. Why don't we talk about something else? Tool said, such as, talk glanced over at the other hill. Only Lady Envy's head and knees were visible above the tub's framework. The sunset blazed behind her. Mock and Thrul stood guard over her, facing outward. Talk said, her. Tool said, of Lady Envy, I know little more than what I've already said. Talk said, she was a companion of Anamander Rakes. Tool resumed his work and said, at first there were three others who wandered together for a time. Anamanda Rake, Caladan Brood, and a sorceress who eventually ascended to become the Queen of Dreams. Following that event, dramas ensued, or so it is told. The Son of Darkness was joined by Lady Envy and the soul taken known as Osric, another three who wandered together. Caladan Brood chose a solitary path at the time and was not seen on this world for score centuries. When he finally returned, perhaps a thousand years ago, he carried the hammer he still carries, a weapon of the sleeping goddess. Talk said, and Rake, Envy and this Ostrich, what were they up to? Tool shrugged and said, of that only they could tell you. There was a falling out. Osric is gone, where no one knows. Anamander Rake and Lady Envy remained companions. It is said they parted argumentatively in the days before the Ascendants gathered to chain the Fallen One. Rake joined in that effort. The Lady did not. Of her, this is the sum of my knowledge, soldier. Culp had some knowledge of Anamander Rake and Osric in Deadhouse Gates. When they were in the nascent, trying to escape on board the Salanda, he felt a soul-taken presence of immense power approaching. We know now it was a Talan MS bonecaster, but in the lead-up, he thought the following. Quote, O oh, Hood, soul-taken or divers, but such power. Who in the abyss has such power? He could think of but two, Anamander Rake, the Son of Darkness, and Osric. Both soul-taken, both supremely arrogant. If there were others, the tales of their activities would have reached him. He was certain. Warriors talk about heroes. Mages talk about ascendants. He would have heard. Rake was on Genebacus, and Osric was reputed to have journeyed to a continent far to the south a century or so back, end quote. An additional point here, I enjoyed this information about the dynamics of the relationship between Rake, Brood, Triss, which is the Queen of Dreams, and Lady Envy. Yeah. I really like that too. All that info is nice. Talk said, she's a mage. Tool said, the answer to that is before you. Talk said, the hot bathwater appearing from nowhere, you mean. Tool said, I mean the Segula, Talk the younger. Talk grunted then said, ensorcelled, forced to leave her. Hood's breath. She's made them slaves. Tool paused to regard him. He asked, this bothers you? Are there not slaves in the Malazan Empire? Talk said, I, debtors, petty criminals, spoils of war. But, Tool, these are Segula, the most feared warriors on this continent, especially the way they attack without the slightest warning, for reasons only they know. Tool said, their communication is mostly nonverbal. They assert dominance with posture, faint gestures, direction of stance, and tilt of head. Talk blinked then asked, they do? Oh, then why haven't I, in my ignorance, been cut down long ago? Tool said, your unease in their presence conveys submission. <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> Talk said, a natural coward, that's me. I take it then that you show no unease. Tool said, I yield to no one, Talk the Younger. This statement says so much about him. Limitless confidence and an unbreakable will. It's amazing. Nice. Yeah, I love that. I love that statement from him. I love this part with him and Tool, the learning and how to, you know, I, something about this has always kind of struck me. It's, I think we're seeing it's like the beginning of some kind of friendship. It's an odd friendship, but I sense something of some kind of kinship or something. I don't know what it is, but it's interesting with talking tool. Yeah. Do you think that talk expressing interest in the ways of tools people helped bring that friendship along? I do. I think so very much. First off, he's genuinely interested because it's going to help him out. But it's like, man, this is, I think Tool is reacting very interestingly to it. You know, it's not what I'd expect in a way that he te- he's, he's still teaching. Like he's sitting there teaching. Talk was silent, thinking on Tool's words. Then he said, that oldest brother, Mock, his mask bears but twin scars. I think I know what that means. And if I'm right, he slowly shook his head. Tool glanced up, shadowed gaze not wavering from Tok's face. He said, the young one who challenged me, Senu, was good. 
Had I not anticipated him, had I not prevented him from fully drawing his swords, our duel might well have been a long one. Talk scowled. He said, how could you tell how good he was when he didn't even get his swords clear of their scabbards? Tool said, he parried my attacks with them nonetheless. What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Talk's lone eye slowly widened. He asked, he parried you with half-drawn blades? Tool said, the first two attacks, yes, but not the third. I need only to study the eldest's movements, the lightness of his steps on the earth, his grace, to sense the full measure of his skill. Senu and Thirul both acknowledge him as their master. Clearly, you believe, by virtue of his mask, that he is highly ranked among his own kind. Tox said, third, I think. Third highest. There's supposed to be a legendary Segula with an unmarked mask. White porcelain. Not that anyone has ever seen him, except the Segula themselves, I suppose. They are a warrior caste ruled by the champion that person must be an absolute animal also it should be noted that women can also be highly ranked in the segula hierarchy as well it's not only males in the top 10 right right do you imagine that it's a lot of dueling constant strife between this or is there some kind of organization to this do you think that someday like number 3552 is going to go say you know i i, I just feel like challenging number one today or is it you know, or is it just like no chance you got to rise to the ranks or, or what i mean <laughs> when i think about the potential scenarios i suppose there's the possibility that some brash young person may try to challenge somebody several levels above them but i would think that there would have to be some measure of confidence that they would be able to beat them in order to go that far. Mm. Also, given how I view this culture, mm. it, I see it a lot like Japanese culture, okay. and they have very rigid social structure from the perspective that they're programmed culturally to look at certain things as acceptable. There are certain protocols that should be in place, certain ways to behave. Okay. And I don't see a lot of people stepping out okay. within the culture I don't want to jump too far ahead for those that don't fit into the structure because eventually we'll get introduced to some individuals who have decided to leave that society, but we'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to say much more right now. So yeah, just like any other society, you know, there's always going to be black sheep that don't fit in with the rest of the people, you know, <laughs> and they'll go find somewhere where they feel comfortable. Right. right. But to answer your question, I don't think it's just constantly boom, boom, boom. You're always under assault. Right, okay. The people that are below have to think they have some chance of winning. Now, that being said, I wonder at a scenario where somebody challenges somebody above them and they fail, but then they're beat up pretty bad. And then maybe somebody below them trying to take advantage of that. Maybe something like that could happen too. Sure. I don't know. Okay. There may be a lot of calculation involved in yeah. it too. Okay. Tok turned to study the two distant warriors, then glanced over his shoulder at Senu, who still knelt over the antelope not ten paces away. Tok said, So what has brought them to the mainland, I wonder? Tool said, You might ask the youngest, Tok. Tok grinned at Tool and said, Meaning you're as curious as I am. Well, I am afraid I can't do your dirty work for you, since I rank below him. He may choose to speak with me, but I cannot initiate. If you want answers, it is up to you to ask the questions. Tool set down his materials, then rose to his feet in a muted clack of bones. He strode towards Senu. Talk followed. Tool said, warrior. Senu paused in his butchering, dipped his head slightly. Tool continued, what has driven you to leave your homeland? What has brought you and your brothers to this place? Senu's reply was a dialect of Daru, slightly archaic to Talk's ears. He said, Master Stoneblade, we are the punitive army of the Segula. Had anyone other than a Segula made such a claim... Talk would have laughed outright. As it was, he clamped his jaw tight. Mm. I don't know how Mr. Erickson comes up with this stuff, but it is so cool. Yeah. The Segula, they get me really excited. Such an intriguing culture. They're sending three people as a punitive <laughs> army <laughs> to, to go to war. I, <laughs> Crazy. My, the question is here is... Do they think that they're sending too many or not enough is a really another question. It's like, mm. is that enough or is that just or right. is that too many? Yeah, is, just is that right. just right? It's like, that's pretty scary. It's like, wow. These, yeah. these three here equal the continent's worth of fighters in our estimation of y'all. You know, it's like, well, madness. Is it madness if you can back it up? I'm just saying it's crazy to think that that is how it would play out. Okay, right. Okay, copy that. Tool seemed as taken aback as was talk, for it was a long moment before he spoke again. Tool said, punitive. 
Whom does the Segula seek to punish? Senu said, invaders to our island. We kill all that come, yet the flow does not cease. The task is left to our black masks, the first level initiates in the schooling of weapons. For the enemy comes unarmed, and so are not worthy of dueling. But such slaughter disrupt the discipline of training, stains the mind, and so damages the rigors of mindfulness. It was decided to travel to the homeland of these invaders, to slay the one who sends his people to our island. I have given you answer, Master Stoneblade. I think that goes into answer about your that, that they do indeed maintain a very rigid discipline. They're not even going to bother the regular higher ranked people. They're just going to send the lowest ranked people to deal with this problem. They do it, but they're aware of the problems. They do it knowingly. That's what's impressive. It's like, we know what we're doing. We know what to do with this kind of thing. We send them out there because it's going to stay in the mind. It'll take care of the weak ones. Let them weed out the weak. <laughs> Can't have these dangerous fanatics coming in here spreading their nonsense. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Got to clamp down. Got to clamp that stuff down, baby. <laughs> Having recently watched Shogun, <laughs> it's kind of crazy thinking how hard it must have been for the initial missionaries that went to Japan. Oh. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Some bold folks. Some bold people. You know. It probably played out like this right here. <laughs> I, I, I imagine so. I she's exactly kind of you know strangely enough I have that exact same image I haven't watched Shogun yet I've been dying to I keep forgetting about it so it's like oh my good gracious I must watch that now but it's like for some strange reason that's exactly what I see it's like now I see a bunch of Christian missionaries on the beach <laughs> it's the Japanese by the time <laughs> Shogun takes place they've already gotten a foothold there okay. so it wasn't the initial people that went because okay. the Portuguese have a foothold there when the English guy shows up okay. this is a fictional story. It does have characters that were alive in history. I haven't studied the real history right. to know what is actually happened versus what was changed for his story. I'm pretty sure it's accurate. I'm under the impression that the book Shogun is historically accurate where it's about history. But of course, the rest of it's a historical drama set in a historical period. So it's a lot of liberty taken with a story that didn't take place to explain a story that really took place. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, yes. <laughs> Tool asked, do you know the name of these people, the name by which they call themselves? Senu said, priests of Panyan. They come seeking to convert. We are not interested. They do not listen. And now they warn of sending an army to our island. To show our eagerness for such an event, we sent them many gifts. They chose to be insulted by our invitation to war. We admit we do not understand and have therefore grown weary of discourse with these Panyans. From now on, only our blades will speak for the Segula. Tool said, yet Lady Envy has ensnared you with her charms. Tox's breath caught. Senu dipped his head again, said nothing. Tool went on, fortunately, we are now traveling towards the Panyan Daman. Senu grated, the decision pleased us. Tool asked, how many years since your birth, Senu? Senu said, 14, wow. Master Stoneblade. I am 11th level initiate. This is ridiculous. <laughs> the first wow. sword of the Talan I mass was tested by a 14-year-old? That's a, what are these people yeah, capable I'm really of? I'm scared. <laughs> we should be scared of these people. It excites me, man. Yeah, it does. But I don't, I don't think they're, it's like they're not interested in conquest, though. Or are they? I don't know. There's some stuff we can't talk about that Orb Scepter Throne gets into about okay. their past history. So oh, that's true. I don't want to say too much. Okay. Right now. We'll leave it alone. Yeah. Live it along. Square cut pieces of meat on skewers dripped sizzling fat into the flames. Lady Envy appeared from the gloom with her entourage in tow. She was dressed in a thick midnight blue robe that hung down to brush the dew-laden grasses. Her hair was tied back into a single braid. She exclaimed, A delicious aroma! I am famished! Tot caught Thurul's casual turn, gloved hands lifting. The unsheathing of his two swords was faster than Tok's eye could track, as was the whirling attack. Sparks flashed as bright steel struck flint. Tool was driven back a half dozen paces as blow after blow rained down on his own blurred weapon. The two warriors vanished into the darkness beyond the hearth's lurid glow. Wolf and dog barked, plunging after them. Lady Envy snapped, This is infuriating! <laughs> Sparks exploded ten paces away. Insufficient light for talk to discern anything more than the vague twisting of arms and shoulders. He shot a glance at Mok and Senu. The latter still crouched at the hearth, studiously tending to the supper. The twin-scarred eldest stood motionless, watching the duel, though it seemed unlikely he could see any better than Tok could. Tok thought, maybe he doesn't need to. More sparks rained through the night. This would be an amazing scene visually. 
the sparks appearing with only hints of movement in the gloom it lends a lot to the imagination i agree it would be absolutely brilliant just amazing to see yeah and then to hear all the action you see some stuff you hear a lot of it but you're not fully aware of what's going on i think it could yes. be done very well oh yes agreed lady envy stifled a giggle one hand to her mouth talk murmured i take it you can see in the dark lady she said oh yes this is an extraordinary duel I have never, no, it's more complicated. An old memory, dredge free when you first identified these as Segula. Anamander Rake once crossed blades with a score of Segula, one after the other. He'd paid an unannounced visit to the island, knowing nothing of the inhabitants. Taking human form and fashioning a mask for himself, he elected to walk down the city's main thoroughfare. Being naturally arrogant, he showed no deference to any who crossed his path. <laughs> Another clash lit up the night, the exchange followed by a loud, solid grunt. Then the blades collided once again. Lady Envy went on. Two bells. That was the full duration of Rake's visit to the island and his people. He described the ferocity of that short time and his dismay and exhaustion, which led him to withdraw into his warren, if only to slow the hammering of his heart. Wow. Think of how powerful Animander Rake is. He must have been under pure assault for two hours straight to need to flee like that. <laughs> I know it. it. I'm kind of shocked he backed down because I'm assuming we'd mentioned this type of power versus power. He probably could have wiped them out if he wanted to or hurt some. But do you think he was not showing deference or do you think he was just unaware that he was not showing deference to these people? He probably didn't even know about their she said he had no idea about any of their cultural practices yeah he wouldn't even know to give deference he probably has a real straight back heads held high <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna look real confident oh, walking down yeah, the street. yeah 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 he does <laughs> yeah he does what right do you think that's a motor was was what do you mean? Hasn't it been implied that Dasim is dead? Yeah, but you're assuming that he had something to do with getting ranked with the Segula? Like, where do I think he would fit in with, yeah. in their ranks? Yeah. We know nothing of him, but he's spoken of with legend. So I was just curious. You've opened a very dangerous door, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I have. I'm sorry. I laid that landmine right at your feet. I apologize. I'm going to lock <laughs> this door and throw away the key. <laughs> okay. Agreed. Agreed, sir. Move along. <laughs> a new voice rasping and cold now spoke black sword they turned to see mock facing them lady envy said that was centuries ago mock said the memory of worthy opponents does not fade among the segula mistress mm. lady envy said rake said the last swordsman he faced wore a mask with seven symbols mock tilted his head and said that mask still awaits him black sword holds the seventh position mistress we would have him claim it she smiled and said, perhaps soon you can extend to him the invitation in person. Mock said, it is not an invitation, mistress. It is a demand. I am amazed that Rake only made it to the seventh spot. As am I. But this means that <laughs> there are six fellas or six segula <laughs> inside Dragnapur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Now, I will say this. Rake doesn't specialize in only martial combat with a sword like yep. the Segula. He uses sorcery and his soul taken form when required. Perhaps this handicap evens the playing field a bit. But still, I maintain that the high ranking Segula are likely some of the most capable individuals on the entire planet when it comes to fighting. Agreed. Lady Envy's laugh was sweet and full throated. She said, Dear servant, there is no one whom the Lord of Darkness will not meet with a steady, unwavering eye. Consider that a warning. Mock said, Then shall our swords cross, mistress. He is the seventh, I am the third. She turned on him, arms folded, and said, Oh, really? Do you know where that score of Segula souls ended up when he killed them, including the seventh? Chained within the sword of Dragnapur, that's where. For eternity. Do you truly wish to join them, Mock? There was another loud thud from the darkness beyond the firelight, then silence. Mock said, Segula who die, fail. We spare no thoughts for the failed among us. Talk softly asked, does that include your brother? Tool had reappeared, his flint sword in his left hand, dragging Thurul's body by the collar with his right. The Segula's head lulled. Dog and wolf trailed the two, tails wagging. They're enjoying this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, they are. Lady Envy asked, have you killed my servant, Talani Mass? Tool replied, I have not. Broken wrist, broken ribs, a half dozen blows to the head. I believe he will recover eventually. 
Lady Envy said, well, that won't do at all, I'm afraid. Bring him here, please, to me. Mock said, he is not to be healed magically. The lady's temper snapped then. She spun, a wave of argent power surging out from her. It struck Mock, threw him back through the air. He landed with a heavy thud. The coruscating glare <laughs> vanished. She said, servants do not make demands of me. I remind you of your place, Mock. I trust once is enough. She swung her attention back to Thirul and said, heal him I shall. After all, she continued in a milder tone, as any lady of culture knows, three is the absolute minimum when it comes to servants. She laid a hand on the Segula's chest. It's a shame the uh, coruscation wasn't um, ochre hued. <laughs> I wonder if that's even possible. I, I know. I don't know. It'd be dirty. It's really dirty. <laughs> dirty coruscation. Well, I think it can. chaos is kind of like that way. Isn't chaos kind of dirty looking? I think it's silvery. There's flecks of black in it, if I remember. Okay. Real, I'm, thinking, I'm uh, trying oh, to think of the best way. There's some spells in Elden Ring that look like what I imagine chaos would look like. Think about it like this, of a raging river in winter time. It's like ice, like an ice flow breaking up. That kind of dirty, but white and gray and silver, probably kind of just all rolled in together. Just kind of mishmash like that. Mm -hmm. Thirul groaned. Tot glanced at Tool and exclaimed, Hood's breath, you're all chopped up. <laughs> Tool said, it has been a long time since I last faced such a worthy opponent. All the more challenging for using the flat of my blade. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> the flat. The flat. Wow. I mean, dude, I mean, it's so if he wasn't using the flat of his blade, would he have been like cutting through their, would he possibly cut through their swords if he had so wished? I think so. Probably. Well, my respect for Tool continues to increase. Oh, yeah. Mock was slowly climbing to his feet. At Tool's last words, he went still, then slowly faced the undead warrior. Tok thought, I'll be damned. Tool, you gave the third pause. <laughs> In a stern voice, Lady Envy said, there will be no more duels this night. I'll not constrain my wrath the next time. Bad kitty. Bad kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Mock casually slid his attention away from Tool, straightening Lady Envy's side. Thirul is mended. I am almost weary. Senu, dear, get out the plates and utensils. And the Ellen red. A nice quiet meal is called for, I should say. She flashed Tok a smile and said, and witty discourse, yes? It was now Tok's turn to groan. <laughs> I really enjoyed this part of the chapter. So much was revealed about the Segula and Rake in this short section. Oh, just absolutely a real gem of a chapter here with all this info. I loved it, man. The three horsemen drew rein to halt on the low hill's summit. Pulling his mount around to face the city of Pale, Whiskey Jack stared for a time, jaw muscles bunching. Quick Ben said nothing, watching Whiskey Jack, his old friend, with fullest understanding. He thought, Upon this hill we came to retrieve Hairlock, amidst piles of empty armor, gods, they're still here, rotting in the grasses, and the sorceress Tattersail, the last left standing of the cadre. We just crawled out of the collapsed tunnels, leaving hundreds of brothers and sisters buried behind us. We burned with rage. We burned with the knowledge of betrayal. Here, on the sorcery blasted hill, we were ready to commit murder with cold, cold hands. Quick Ben glanced over at Mallet. The healer's small eyes were narrowed on Whiskey Jack, and Quick Ben knew that he too was reliving bitter memories. He thought, there is no bearing the history of our lives. Yellow nails and fingers of bone claw up from the ground at our feet and hold us fast. Whiskey Jack growled, summarize, his gray eyes on the empty sky above the city. <laughs> I absolutely love the terse nature of the request. Do you think it speaks to their long familiarity with one another? Oh, absolutely. Mallet cleared his throat and asked, who starts? Whiskey Jack swung his head to Mallet. Mallet said, right, Perrin's affliction. His mortal flesh has the taint of ascendant blood and ascendant places. But as Quick will tell you, neither one should be manifesting as illness. No, that blood and those places are like shoves down a corridor. Quick Ben added, and he keeps crawling back, trying to escape. And the more he tries, Mallet finished, the sicker he gets. Whiskey Jack, eyes once again on pale, grimaced wryly. He said, the last time I stood on this hill, I had to listen to Quick and Kalam finishing each other's sentences. Turns out less has changed than I'd thought. Is the captain himself ascendant? I'll tell you what, as I'm going through making notes to talk about the chapter, I had made a note about Quick Ben finishing Kalam's sentences and vice versa. And then I read this and I started cracking up. <laughs> it's such great stuff, man. 
Makes it so funny. Yeah, it's good. Quick Ben said, as near as, he thought, and needless to say, that's worrying, but it'd be even more worrying if Perrin wanted it. Then again, who knows what ambitions lie hidden beneath that reluctant visage? Whiskey Jack asked, what do you two make of his tale of the hounds and rake's sword? Mallet replied, troubling. Quick Ben said, that's an understatement. Damned scary. Whiskey Jack scowled at him. He asked, why? Quick Ben said, Dragnapur is not rake's sword. He didn't forge it. How much does the bastard know about it? How much should he know? And where in Hood's name did those hounds go? Wherever it is, Perrin's linked by blood with one of them. Mallet jumped in, and that makes him unpredictable. Whiskey Jack asked, what's at the end of this corridor you described? Mallet said, I don't know. Quick Ben said, me neither. But I think we should add a few shoves of our own, if only to save Perrin from himself. Whiskey Jack asked, and how do you propose we do that? Quick Ben grinned. He said, it's already started, Commander, connecting him to Silver Fox. She reads him like Tattersail did, a deck of dragons, sees more every time she rests eyes on him. Mallet said, maybe that's just Tattersail's memories, undressing him. Whiskey Jack drawled, very funny. So, Silver Fox dips into his soul. No guarantee she'll be sharing her discoveries with us, is there? Quick Ben said, if Tattersail and Nightchill's persona come to dominate, Whiskey Jack said, the sorceress is well enough, but Nightchill, he shook his head. Quick Ben said, she was a nasty piece of work. Something of a mystery there. Still, a malazan. Whiskey Jack growled, of whom we know very little. Remote. Cold. Mallet asked, what was her warren? Quick Ben sourly said, Roshan, as far as I could tell. Darkness. After a moment, Mallet said, that's knowledge that Silver Fox can draw on then. Quick Ben said, probably instinctively, in fragments. Not much of Night Chill survived, I gather. Whiskey Jack asked, are you sure of that wizard? Quick Ben said, no. He thought, about Night Chill, I'm less sure than I'm implying. There have been other Night Chills, long before the Malazan Empire, the first age of the Nathalog Wars, the liberation of Kara Karang on Seven Cities, nine centuries back, the Seti and their expulsion from Fen on Quan Tali almost 2,000 years ago, a woman, a sorceress named Night Chill, again and again, if she's the same one, so we do get a little bit more of her backstory, seeing what happened between when Kalor cursed her and now. Yeah, that's really cool. I enjoyed hearing that long, that she's popped up here and there and just hanging out with the mortals for some reason. Not sure why, it, 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 but very interesting. If I had to guess, based off of what I picked up in the prologue, because we really don't get a lot of dialogue with her, it seemed like she was bored with the Ascendancy thing. She just wanted to go deal with the mortal drama yeah that's very much the impression i got too just kind of want to go go walk like uh jewel says in pulp fiction she's gonna walk the earth <laughs> whiskey jack leaned in his saddle and spat to the ground he said i'm not happy quick ben and mallet said nothing quick ben thought i'd tell him about burn but if he ain't happy now what'll the news of the world's impending death do to him <laughs> no deal with that one on your own quick and be ready to jump when the time comes the crippled gods declared war on the gods, on the Warrens, on the whole damn thing and every one of us in it. Fine, O oh fallen one, but that means you'll have to outwit me. Forget the gods and their clumsy games. I'll have you crawling in circles before long. Man, such confidence from this guy. Yeah, he almost got smacked down by that boy. If he, if he wasn't saved by a burn, you know, he's being kind of braggadocious here. <laughs> the stuff that he does, though, is so audacious. He's got to have a little bit of that confidence oh, yeah. to do the stuff that he does. I, I agree. And he probably gets away with a lot of it because everyone is shocked at the brash nature of what he does. Yeah. Moments passed. The horse is motionless under the riders, except for the flicking of tails and the twitching of coats and ears to ward off biting flies. Finally, Whiskey Jack said, keep facing Perrin in the right direction. Shove when the opportunity arises. Quick Ben, find out all you can about Nightchill through any and every source available. Mallet, explain about Perrin to Spindle. I want all three of you close enough to the captain to count nose hairs. He gathered the reins and swung his mount round. He said, the Darujistan contingents due to arrive at Broods any time now. Let's head back. They rode down from the hill and its ruinous vestiges at a canter, leaving the flies buzzing aimlessly above the summit. This comment about the flies on the summit here, Talk had just recommended that they camp on top of a hill so that mm. the breeze would blow the biting insects away. I yes. wonder if the fact that this is on top of a barrow has anything to do with all these flies being up there. Cause normally you would expect the bugs to get blown away. Cause I think even yeah. in 
Dead House Gates, it was mentioned that they put their tents when they went to go visit those horse warriors. Mm-hmm. Fiddler raced those guys to their camp. I think that was on top as well. Yes, I've seen it in... Uh... Also mentioned in Open Range, Kevin Costner movie, you know, that's they're out on the prairie sleeping. And they talk about, you know, well, put the herd here and we'll camp up there on top of the hill so the mosquitoes and stuff don't eat us kind of deal, you know. Okay. Whiskey Jack reined in before the tent that had been provided for Dujack One Arm, his horse breathing hard from the extended ride through the Bridgeburners encampment where he'd left Quickban and Mallet and into Brood's sprawled camp. He swung from the saddle, wincing as he stepped down on his bad leg. The standard bear Artanthos appeared and said, I'll take the reins, Commander. The beast needs rubbing down. Whiskey Jack muttered, He ain't the only one. One arm's within? Artanthos said, Aye. He's been expecting you. Without another word, Whiskey Jack entered the tent. From his cot, Dujak growled, Damned about time. Pour <laughs> some ale there on the table. Find a chair. You hungry? Whiskey Jack said, No. Dujak said, Me neither. Let's drink. Neither spoke until Whiskey Jack had finished repositioning furniture and pouring ale. The silence continued until they'd both finished the first tankards and Whiskey Jack refilled them from the jug. That's a long moment of silence as they drink their first tankards. Again, I think of how long these two have known each other and worked together. Yes, and uh, I agree with that. And uh, it shows, I think, in scenes like this where you've got buddies like this and you all have obviously worked together for decades, it's time to take a moment catch your breath and get a moment's comfort just from being near a stable source. It's a buddy. I mean, that, that provides some comfort. Agreed. Dujek said, moon spawn. If we're lucky, we'll see it again, but not till coral or even later. So Anamander Rakes agreed to throw his and the moon's weight against this Panion Domin. Reasons unknown. Maybe he just likes a fight. Whiskey Jack frowned. He said, at pale, he struck me as a reluctant combatant, Dujek. Dujek said, only because his tis and D were busy elsewhere. Good thing too, or we would have been annihilated. Whiskey Jack said, you might be right. Seems we're mustering a whole lot to take on a middling-sized empire of zealots, Dujek. I know, the Domins smelled foul from the start, and something's building, even so. Dujek said, aye. We'll see what we see. Did you speak with Twist? Whiskey Jack nodded and said, he agrees that his flights should remain unseen. No supplying of our forces on the march, if at all possible. He has scouts seeking a strategic place to hold up close to the Panion border, hidden but close enough to strike when the time comes. Dujek said, good. And is our army ready to leave Pale? Whiskey Jack said, as ready as it'll ever be. The question of supply on the march remains. Dujek said, we'll cover that when the emissaries from Darujistan get here. Now, Silver Fox. Whiskey Jack said, hard to say, Dujek. This gathering of Talani Mass is worrying, especially when she asserts that we'll all need those undead warriors when we take on the Panion Domin. High Fist, we don't know enough about our enemy. Dujek said, that will change. Have you instructed Quick Ben on initiating contact with that mercenary company in Kapustan? Whiskey Jack said, he's worked something out. We'll see if they take the bait. Dujek said, back to Silver Fox, Whiskey Jack. Tattersail was a solid ally, a friend. Whiskey Jack said, she's there in this Revi child. Perrin and she have spoken. He fell silent for a moment, then sighed, his eyes on the tankard in his hands. He said, things have yet to unfold, so we'll just have to wait and see. Dujak said, any creature that so devours its parent. Whiskey Jack said, aye. But then again, whenever have the Talani Mass shown a speck of compassion? They're undead, soulless, and let's face it, once allies are not, damned horrific. They're on the Emperor's leash and no one else's. Fighting alongside them back in Seven Cities was not a comforting experience. We both know that, Dujek. Dujek muttered, expedience always comes arm in arm with discomfort. And now they're back. Only this time, they're on a child's leash. Whiskey Jack grunted, then said, That's a curious observation, but I see what you mean. Kelonved showed restraint with the Talani Mouse, discounting that mess at Aaron, whereas a child, born of ravaged souls within the Warren of Talon, acquiring such power, Dujek said, And how many children have you met capable of showing restraint? Tattersail's wisdom needs to come to the fore, and soon. That is a great point. I can't imagine a normal 10 or 12 year old being in control of forces capable of what the Talani mass are capable of. That could be a very troubling and scary thought for these people. Are are we, you know, are we sitting up here with our next enemy? Possibly. I was just thinking of from personal experience and how kids of that age can't control their emotions, having the power of thousands of undead warriors that can turn into dust. It'd be a nightmare. My school teacher, this is my school teacher, and you know, I'm so bad. <laughs> Forget the toilet paper, and we're telling them I'm asking them tonight. <laughs> Whiskey Jack said, 
We'll do all we can, Dujek. Dujek sighed, then nodded. He asked, Now, your sense of our newfound allies. Wissijak said, The departure of the Crimson Guard is a blow. A disparate collection of dubious mercenaries and hangers-on in their place signifies a drop in quality. The Mott Irregulars are the best of the bunch, but that's not saying a whole lot. The Revian Bargast are solid enough, as we both know, and the Tistandi are unequaled. Still, Brood needs us. Badly. Dujek said, Perhaps more than we need him and his forces. Aye. In a normal kind of war, that is. Whiskey Jack said, Rake and Moonspawn are Brood's true shaved knuckles in the hole. High Fist, with the Talani mass joined to our cause, I cannot see any force on this continent or any other that could match us. God knows, we could annex half the continent. Dujek said, could we now? Stow that thought, old friend. Stow it deep so it never again sees the light of day. We're about to march off and sword kiss a tyrant. What happens afterwards is a discussion that will have to await another time. Right now, we're both edging around a deadly pit. Whiskey Jack said, aye, we are. Kalor. Dujek repeated, Kalor. Whiskey Jack said, he will try to kill the child. Dujek said, he won't. If he tries, Brood will go for him. Kaladan Brood is the real shaved knuckle in the hole, old friend. I've read of his times up around later on, in the Nathalog histories. Hood's breath, you don't want to get him riled. Whether you're an ally or an enemy makes no difference to Brood when his rage is unleashed. At least with Animander Rake, it's a cold, taut power. Not so with the Warlord. That hammer of his. It's said that it's the only thing that can awaken burn. Swing it against the ground hard enough and the goddess will open her eyes. And the truth is, if Brood didn't have the strength to do so, he wouldn't be carrying the hammer in the first place. Whiskey Jack mused on this for a while then said, We have to hope that Brood remains as the child's protector. Dujek said, Kalor will work to sway the warlord with argument rather than with his sword. He may well seek Rake's support as well. Whiskey Jack eyed Dujek then said, Kalor has paid you a visit. Dujek admitted, I. And he's a persuasive bastard, even to the point of dispelling his enmity towards you. He's not been physically struck in centuries, or so he said. He also said he deserved it. Whiskey Jack drawled, generous of him. He thought, when it's politically expedient. In a cold tone, he said, I'll not stand to one side in the butchering of a child, no matter what power or potential is within her. Dujek glanced up and said, in defiance of my command, should I give it? Whiskey Jack said, we've known each other for a long time, Dujek. Dujek said, I, we have. Stubborn. Whiskey Jack said, when it matters. The two men said nothing for a time. Then Dujek looked away and sighed, I should bust you back down to sergeant. Whiskey Jack laughed. Dujek growled, pour me another. We've got an emissary from Darujistan on the way, and I want to be properly cheerful when he arrives. It's hilarious that Dujek is experiencing the same thing with Whiskey Jack that Whiskey Jack is experiencing with Perrin. I guess all this moving up and down the ladder in command doesn't help matters. I forget this because it's mentioned right in the gardens it is inverted in whiskey jack do jack's commander in the intro to yes so it's like there's that inversion so that would be a difficult thing in a way if these two weren't so close it could be difficult yeah so do jack was below whiskey jack at one point and then whiskey jack was below perrin at one point and then now whiskey jack's above perrin yeah. and below do jack <laughs> it's all messed up yeah 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 it's like, who's on first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop there for this week, and we will finish. Well, we're not going to finish out the chapter next week. This is a long chapter. We will continue the chapter next yes, week. For standout moments, learning more about the dynamics of the relationship between Rake, Brood, Triss, or the Queen of Dreams, and Lady Envy. That's really cool and very interesting. And I, I love that we, even though it's not much, and overall, we get more info on some of the heavier players that we don't really know and some that we've just heard hinted at since Gardens of the Moon. It's nice to hear some, you know, what's like, what, what? That's yeah. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I also forgot to mention Osric in there. Osric's another one that we learned more about. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Tool saying that he yields to no one, I actually got chills mm. down my spine. I was Dude. like, man, this guy right here. Mm. Yeah, Tool is the man. That's where he's always, I've loved him from day one, but I, I just really love when the more he, we kind of warm up to this undead thing. Yeah. He's not as cold as we think. I think the reason that impacts me so much is there's always this piece of me that does not want to comply. <laughs> Yes, agreed. And so that's the I, I, I am very it's, much that way. Where you can be unbound like that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's very much how I am. Unfortunately, we do comply, you know, with the laws and everything. We so, do. and I'm not saying that yeah. I would break every law. I'm just saying that 
there's a lot of shenanigans going on. There's a great little is a story about somebody get, putting their kid in trouble, you know, and they send it to their room to sit down, you know, sit in the corner, you know, or whatever, you know. And it's like, are you sitting down in that corner? It's like, yeah, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mind that nobody can affect, right? You have your, your mind prison. Yes, <laughs> yes. The amount of information that we got about the Segula culture in this chapter, I love it so much. They send three people as an army to assassinate the leader of the Panyan Daman because they don't want these missionaries coming anymore. It's madness. <laughs> it is madness. And my question is, well, if it was this just for an assassination, I guess it'd be different. But if they were as the punitive force, wouldn't a human wave just take these fellows down regardless of their skill? Yeah. I mean, realistically, the Teneskari horde would eat them alive. Right. <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> Yes, they would. Yeah, but th they're probably more of a tactical, very focused, almost like a special operations infiltration. Still team stick. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Thurul's duel with Tool was absolutely incredible. Finding out he's 14. Hold on. No, Senu's 14. Thurul's the middle one. Oh, sorry. That just got the duel. But please continue. Okay. Oh yeah, but yeah. Oh, that's a great duel too. That's the, is that we're talking about with the sparks in the darkness. Yes. Yeah, that's really cool. And the reveal that it's the flat of the blade. Well, I mean, it comes later, but the fact that he fought him with the flat of his blade, he might not have been so chewed up if he chose to take him out. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> multiple blows to the head, broken wrist. I mean, he's he's popping them all over the place. I'm sure one well swung <laughs> attack would have ended it. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Well, finding out Senu is 14 is fantastic reveal there too. So flabbergasting. What's bad is he joins other famous youngsters in literature, you know, like Paul. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Alex from Clockwork Orange. He's only like 12, 13, something like that. He's a youngster as well. And so, yeah, we got another interesting youngster here. Mm. So nice, nice finding that out. <laughs> I find it fascinating that you included Clockwork Orange in with the other two. <laughs> It's literature. It was a book first. Okay, gotcha. It's a book first, yes. So, yes. And a great book and a great film. I'm sorry. I have a, a natural love for that movie. I actually have an autograph from Malcolm, script and picture. I have framed. I've got it mounted. I just need to find a place in the house to mount it because I just love that movie so much. Disturbing. It is. It is. Finding out that Rake visited the island of the Segula and achieved the rank of seventh before he had to flee from exhaustion. That is really awesome, dude. I just, <laughs> it is great info and... To know that they drove him off is wild. I like seeing some of this talk and tool, teacher, mentor. I'm seeing a, a friendship kind of, I'm sensing a friendship. Maybe it's because I want it to be happening here. So I like seeing this. Mm -hmm. I also enjoyed the interactions among the bridge burners and also between Whiskey Jack and Dujek, specifically how they speak to each other in a way that seems like they've known each other for a long time. In particular, I think I, I mentioned it in the last episode about the fact of me loving so much of the soldier interaction. I think this book in particular, we see this is more military than previous. Is, it, uh, is this an accurate description? Yes, because the bridge burners are a military unit. We're getting more of that this time around. Yeah. And so uh, what makes his stories so believable to me has always been the interactions between these friends, but these interactions between longtime companions, um, some of the needling and back and forth, this, and some of it's just this, the knowing what the other person is going to think or do or behave, you know, it is, it's very, uh, it's a long-term relationship that makes these books, makes them so alive and so believable to me. Yeah. All right, Billy, great job tonight. Hey, great episode, man. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Just the fact, man, what a great chapter we have before us. And we've barely scratched the surface. We still, we're going to be in this for at least one or two yeah. more. So I can't wait. This is a great chapter. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.